Hi and welcome to another episode of the History Hut. Uh, the last time we spoke, we looked at the decline of the Mongols. This time around, we'll be looking at the rise of Islam. So as we move a little west into the Middle East, as it were, <laughs> yeah. uh, what do we find there? Well, uh, we talked about the Mongols going west and taking out the Islamic kingdom of Muhammad Shah, but we haven't really discussed what was in that part, the Middle East, and of course we haven't really talked about the Islamic Empire, and that's what we're going to do today. We, we mentioned in our Chinese section the Battle of Talas, um, and we mentioned um, Genghis Khan's Bukhara campaign, so that's the mm -hmm. only times that we've looked at the Middle East, so for by that... You don't really know what's going on, do you? No. <laughs> so please well, tell me, yes, please. Of course, let's save you from reading it. I'm uh, thirsty well, so, for knowledge. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> At last. So what we see is something that begins as a, a religious movement, but soon becomes a rapidly expanding empire that, from the seventh century on, covers the Middle East to Iran, uh, India, uh, to Africa in the the north and west, and then all the way up to Spain. So absolutely massive massive empire and uh, the thing that that's notable about it as well is that it moves with incredible speed um, it's supported by of course trained islamic armies as time goes on and it brings huge swaths of land under its control so it just becomes like a a mini ginormous empire just this great land a empire. mini ginormous a mini empire ginormous empire this this and, and of course that creates this massive internal market so you can more or less uh, by the time it really gets going buy or sell absolutely any product within um, within this empire so anything you desired you could you could grow or um, it, it could be brought to the area then planted, then grown, then traded. So you just amazing amounts of stuff. So it starts off as a religious movement and, and then it, it takes on the kind of trappings of empire as well. It never loses the uh, its its religious side though. Yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit a little bit more about the uh, religious aspect of it. Okay. Uh, well, it begins with the birth of Muhammad uh, in about 570 AD in Mecca. Uh, we don't know a lot about uh, Muhammad's early life. We know that he was brought up by his grandfather and that the tradition was that uh, children would be sent into the desert to lead a, a kind of pure life. So he was sent into the desert. Uh, he was later brought up by his uncle after the, the death of his um, his grandfather and his uncle was a merchant. So he actually, that's where he kind of honed his merchant skills and seems to have traveled uh, quite, uh, quite extensively. And uh, this is a man that had developed a, a really good reputation as somebody that could resolve disputes. So he's seen as, a, as an arbitrator and someone who's, you know, fair amount of respect. Um, he married a wealthy widow who was also a merchant, uh, Khadija, and they have uh, four sons and four daughters. And uh, one of the daughters is Fatima, and Fatima will later, and this will make sense when we talk about this later on, uh, Fatima will later marry Ali. Uh, and the Fatimid dynasty, the Fatimid Islamic dynasty in Egypt, uh, of course, takes its name from uh, from her. So, uh, so this this young man who's become a merchant and who has lots of experience and who's well connected in Mecca, lots of uh, people, you know, respect him, began to receive revelations uh, about the age of forty. Meditated a lot, and he would go into the the hills uh, nearby and the caves nearby, and uh, and meditate. And uh, one, well, I guess the first revelation came to him while he was in a cave in Mount Hira, that's H-I-R-A, and it was the Archangel Gabriel, or Gibral, uh, in, uh, in this case. So the Archangel Gabriel that spoke to him, and the Archangel Gabriel instructed him to recite and so he's really worried about this, as I suppose you know you would be. I um, spoke to his wife and said, you know, I've been receiving these revelations from uh, from God. Um, and Khadija, his wife, was really supportive of him and said, you know, you should do something about this. Don't just ignore it. And of course, these revelations continue throughout his uh, his lifetime. Now. Um, Muhammad couldn't read or write, so he would recite, as he'd been instructed by the angel, he'd recite them, and then uh, scribes and followers would write these things down for him. And uh, Muhammad would then say where each 
was in relation to the other. And of course, this is what makes up the body, uh, the, the sacred uh, Quran, the Holy Quran. So before his death, he recited the entire, the entirety of uh, what would be the Quran, and it's the third caliph uh, after Muhammad, now called the Prophet Muhammad. Um, it's the third caliph, um, Uthman, who has people um, collect all of, of this together and make a, an authorized version. So you get the what's called the Uthmanic Quran, um, and this becomes the the version that. Um, still dominates to this mm -hmm. to this very day what was the response to this like uh, in mecca well uh at first probably um, not too much response at all because you know, the message didn't appeal to everybody and the, the message was quite radical the the radical message was that there is only one god and you should think about him you shouldn't think about other other false gods you shouldn't think about money you shouldn't think about power so you had to give up the worship of other gods and of course at mecca there's a thing called the kaaba um k-a apostrophe a-b-a -A, the kaaba uh, which um Host a number of these false gods, and so people would come to Mecca specifically to uh, to go in there. And so what he was saying was, you can't you can't really do that anymore. You can't worship false gods. And uh, people said to him, well, if if God's speaking to you, where's the miracle? And he said, the miracle is the Quran. The miracle is this this received wisdom. So at first, there's not a lot of opposition in the city to his preaching because he doesn't have a, a large following, but then. Uh, after a while, he starts to get lots of followers, especially from amongst the, the kind of weakest elements of society, women, people, you know, widows, orphans, uh, the kind of dispossessed. Um, and that's when uh, the city fathers start to get a little upset. So when he becomes a bit too popular and people start actually listening to him, mm -hmm. then, then they're, you know, they're upset. And so... Um, his uh, he has a, a, another problem, and that is that his wife and his uncle die in the same year. So the protection that he has uh, is is really affected by this. And at one point, the city fathers actually go to his family and ask them to renounce him so that they could uh, they could kill him and there wouldn't be any revenge killing. So mm -hmm. it, things get really serious. And of course, he's he's actually mocked as well, and his message is mocked. Um, and so things are really, really starting to, to go badly for, uh, for the, the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, none of this actually stops him, uh, but he has to leave Mecca uh, temporarily, at least to find a, a safer place, a kind of safe haven. And what happened at Medina? Well, this, of course, is the safe, uh, the safe haven. Uh, this is a town called Yathrib. And it's renamed Al Medina, the city of the Prophet. So it's uh, it's Medina. He goes to Medina, and uh, not, not a very good hiding space then. Well, yeah, very funny, very funny. Of course, no, they probably just said just keep calling it Rat Yathrib for a while, yeah. and yeah, don't uh. tell. Uh, so it's at Medina that the Umma is formed. That's U M M A, and um, the Umma is people uh, bound by faith, bound to him by faith, not by blood, not by kinship. So th this is really important. So when he goes to, uh, when he goes to Yathrib, uh, the Ummah is formed, and the Ummah, of course, is kind of the, the fundamental group that's around him that contains uh, another group called the Companions of the Prophet. Uh, so he goes to uh, Medina, and that's 622 A.D., and uh, this is actually has a name. It's called the Hegira, the Hegira, H-E-G-I-R-A, the Hegira. And it's year one of the Muslim calendar. So the Muslim calendar created later is called the Jalali. And um, time is, is then counted from, uh, as with all major kind of revolutions, a, a change in, uh, in, in calendars. So time is counted from this year, from the year that he goes to Medina. So this is called... Um, uh, year one, so it's A H. You know, we talked about this before using B C and A D in the year of our Lord. Well, uh, in this case, it's A H Anno Hegira. So six twenty two A D would be one A H. Okay. Right. So working in a different calendar. Um, 
and the, you know what follows is about eight years of uh, consolidation. But not only that, there are lots of um, lots of times when things look really bleak, when you know uh, forces uh, that far outnumber them ten to one are sent from Mecca to get rid of this annoying person mm -hmm. and uh, and fail. And so with every with every success that he has, more people come. Right. You know, this is what normally happens. Um, and so uh, within that eight-year period, he actually, I think in 628, uh, in eight, the AD terms, uh, he actually negotiates a treaty with the Meccans so that uh, uh, he can come in with his followers to Mecca, uh, and, and on, I think on an annual basis. But in 630, uh, anyway, he's, he's powerful enough to surge back into Mecca. So 630 is the, the year when Mecca is attacked. And... Of course, the Meccans in a panic by this time, thinking that they would just all be kind of slaughtered in their beds, uh, but they weren't harmed. So he was, they, you know, he gave word to his uh, to his followers that um, that they weren't to be harmed. And from this point on, then uh, every Muslim was to make the pilgrimage to Mecca or to try and make a pilgrimage to Mecca at least once in their life. And this is a thing called the Hajj, and we'll we'll talk about uh, that, I guess. Should yeah, did tell them. Uh, I've heard of it. So let's, let's talk a little more about it. Yeah. Um, you, you you usually see some references to the Hajj uh, every year on the TV because it's, it's such it's so many people go and it's uh, such an important religious event. So uh, this trip to Mecca can be undertaken at, at any time in the year, but uh, when it's when it takes place in the um, in a specific month, uh, then it's called the Hajj. And uh, in our time, about uh, two million people show up. It's about four or five days long. So about two million people fly in from all over the place. You can imagine that in, in the Prophet Muhammad's time, it wouldn't be anywhere like that. But about two million people go on the Hajj each year. Uh, they go to the, the sacred mosque at uh, Mecca. They walk around the Kaaba, which we'll talk about later on. Uh, walk around the Kaaba seven times um, counterclockwise and then they move between two hills Safa and Marwa also seven times and, and I think in the modern period there's actually a kind of connecting tunnel between the, the uh, Kaaba and, and the hills uh, and then um, a number of other things happen so for instance uh, if, if you just arrived right at the beginning of the Hajj, you would go to Mina, the, the place called Mina, M-I-N-A, and stay until dawn. And then the second day, you would go to the Valley of Arafat and uh, praise Allah and, and meditate. And then you spend the night at a, a place called Mazdalifa and uh, gather stones. And then on day three, you return to Mina and you throw stones at um, this uh, big pillar that, that represents the devil. So you stone the devil. Um, and this is where the devil is thought to have tempted Abraham. And then uh, you, this kind of ends with a, the ritual sacrifice or of, a, of an animal, usually a, a sheep or a goat. And, and this is when a commemoration of when God asked Abraham to sacrifice his son and then uh, decided you know, he didn't have to in the end. <laughs> uh, and then day, days four and five, um, more time spent at Mina. And if you haven't at that point been able to go to uh, the Kaaba or you know, walk around the Kaaba, then uh, you would do that. Um, at, at this point. Uh, just uh, as well, another key month in the Muslim calendar, which is of course a lunar calendar, so that means it, sh it shifts, these, these dates shift. So uh, another, um, another month is the, the month when Ramadan is celebrated and Ramadan is, is a celebration of the first revelations to the Prophet Muhammad, and it lasts 30 days. It's on the lunar cycle, and it begins when the new moon is first sighted. So, for instance, in uh, 2010, our time, that would be 1431 uh, Anno Hijira, and uh, Ramadan started on August the 10th this year it was a wee bit later and through that month uh, there are all sorts of things that that you have to do or have to or not have to do and so um, we should probably um, I'll probably tell you about that in a in another episode all right, all right. Okay. and we'll just we'll continue our discussion of Islam in uh, part two of the history hunt we'll see you there